Well, church history is uh, important, as you know, when defending your view, when defending your eschatology out there. Church history, especially the earliest period, uh, comes in very helpful as far as uh, apologetically in showing that your view existed in earlier times, that uh, the opposing views did not. You can use history to pinpoint when heresies began. And if your view shows up in the very earliest times next to the apostles, it uh, really strengthens your case that you're reading the Bible and believing it the way you should, the way the apostles would have taught and the way the very earliest churches would have taught and worshipped. You'll find various statements in early times that you'll disagree with, but it still it doesn't change that uh, when you take them together, you can see the beliefs that were held in the earliest times and which weren't. Our millennialists understand this, and they also understand that we can use church history to trace the origin of their view back to origin. And one of the ways they try to answer this, you've probably come across it if you've done any uh, debating with Covenant on Millennialists, they refer to a quote from Justin Martyr, which they think describes the existence of Orthodox Amillennialists in his time. Here's one example, and uh, I provide the links for these examples in the description box for this video. In this example here, I put in red, boxed it in. Uh, <clears throat> Justin Martyr died 165 who had Kiliastic tendencies in his theology, mentions differing views in his dialogue with Trypho the Jew, chapter 80. I and many others are of this opinion, premillennialism, and believe that such will take place, as you assuredly are aware. But on the other hand, I signify to you that many who belong to the pure and pious faith and are true Christians think otherwise. And in this example, this actually is the Wikipedia entry for premillennialism. If you read it, you can tell it's written by uh, a millennialist that doesn't like our view very much. But anyways, here's part of what's said in this article. Justin wrote in chapter 80 of his work, Dialogue with Trypho, I and others who are right-minded Christians on all points are assured that there will be a resurrection of the dead and a thousand years in Jerusalem, which will then be built. For Isaiah spoke in that manner concerning this period of a thousand years. Though he conceded earlier in the same chapter that his view was not universal by saying that he and many who belong to the pure and pious faith and are true Christians think otherwise. So here is the use of the passage and the author also seems to be saying Justin groups himself in here. Well that isn't the case at all. We'll see that when we read the quote. But uh, you know this example shows him trying to use a statement from Just Justin to suggest that uh, Orthodox amillennialists existed in Justin's day. In this example, an article on amillennialism in a section called History, they say, but amillennialism also existed side by side. Thus, Justin Martyr, who himself was a premillennialist, referred to the existence of differing views. I admitted to you formerly that I and many others are of this opinion and believe that such will take place, as you assuredly are aware. But, on the other hand, I signify to you that many who belong to the pure and pious faith and are true Christians think otherwise. <laughs> now here's Justin's statement. And Trypho to this replied, I remark to you, sir, that you are very anxious to be safe in all respects since you cling to the scriptures. But tell me, 
do you really admit that this place, Jerusalem, shall be rebuilt? And do you expect your people to be gathered together and made joyful with Christ and the patriarchs and the prophets, both the men of our nation and other proselytes who joined them before your Christ came? Or have you given way and admitted this in order to have the appearance of worsting us in the controversies? Then I answered, I am not so miserable a fellow, Trypho, as to say one thing and think another. I admitted to you formerly that I and many others are of this opinion and believe that such will take place, as you assuredly are aware. But, on the other hand, I signify to you that many who belong to the pure and pious faith and are true Christians think otherwise. Moreover, I pointed out to you that some who are called Christians but are godless and pious heretics teach doctrines that are in every way blasphemous, atheistical, and foolish. For if you have fallen in with some who are called Christians, but who do not admit this truth, and venture to blaspheme the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, who say there is no resurrection of the dead, and that their souls, when they die, are taken to heaven, do not imagine that they are Christians, even as one, if he would rightly consider it, would not admit that the Sadducees or other similar sects are Jews, but are only called Jews and children of Abraham, worshiping God with the lips as God himself declared, but the heart was far from him. But I and others who are right-minded Christians on all points are assured that there will be a resurrection of the dead and a thousand years in Jerusalem, which will then be built, adorned, and enlarged, as the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah and others declare. That comes from Justin Martyr's Dialogue with Trypho, chapter 80. Now the problem with identifying these people Justin's referring to as orthodox amillennialists, the problem with that is that no such thing existed in Justin's time. And really there's two ways of looking at what Justin said that clears up what he was talking about. First of all, it's likely that Justin was referring to Montanism. This group was premillennial and held orthodox doctrine pretty much all around, but they taught that the capital during the kingdom was not to be Jerusalem, but rather in Phrygia. And it could be just something as simple as this, as what Justin was referring to here. Look again at what is said. Now the precise time that Montanism was founded and began as a movement isn't really known, but it was approximately 155 or 156 AD. For example, this is from Orthodox Wiki, their article on Montanism, wherein they say the movement uh, originated about 156. And down below they say, while claiming a conversion to Christianity, Montanus preached and testified what he purported to be the word of God as he traveled among the rural settlements of his native Phrygia and Asia Minor. In these travels, he proclaimed the village of Pepuza as the site of the New Jerusalem. The Orthodox Christians, however, regarded his teaching to be heretical. And here's another example which basically dates the start of Montanism approximately 155 to 156. And these articles are linked in the description box under the video. Here's what the Encyclopedia of Christianity has to say. Priscilla uttered saving words as clear as they are mysterious. She accused the Orthodox of being flesh but hating flesh. Her vision of Christ was all important. Appearing as a woman clothed in a shining robe, Christ came to me. He put wisdom into me and revealed to me that this place, Pepuza, is sacred 
and here Jerusalem will come down from heaven. Details of the oracle come from apocalypses. The book of Revelation supplies the shining robe and the new Jerusalem from heaven. Second Esdras provides the woman with shining face replaced by the new Zion, which is a sacred place with a city, and perhaps also the identification of Zion with Ardab, Montanus's native Ardabau in Phrygia. Montanus claimed forerunners among the prophesying daughters of Philip, of whom two were buried at Heropolis in Phrygia. Papias, bishop of Heropolis, was fascinated by oral tradition and bizarre apocalyptic, which he ascribed to Jesus. The Montanists were conservative in theology, as an oracle shows. God brought forth the word as a root brings forth a tree, and a spring a river, and the sun a ray. Tertullian, the most famous Montanist, held that Jerusalem would in fact be found in Palestine, not Phrygia. Yet the Montanist emphasis on prophecy minimized in post-apostolic times threatened Episcopal authority as well as the tenuous accord between church and state. That is from page 641 of the Encyclopedia of Christianity. And he refers to Priscilla here, who was one of the original prophetesses of Montanism. And she likewise gave a prophecy about uh, the New Jerusalem being in Phrygia. Now with the movement springing up in 155 AD and with Justin living to 165 but writing his material toward the end of his life, you can see how he would have been aware of this difference in opinion about the capital and was likely referring to Montanism in that part of his dialogue with Trifo. Now there's a second way of looking at this statement from Justin, and this comes from George Peters in his book, The Theocratic Kingdom. He says, another disreputable mode of procedure to lower the fathers in the estimation of others or to make them contradictory is one, to interpolate or omit, two, to ascribe to them what they never said, three, and to ascribe to them some heretical sentiments. In reference to the first, Brooks shows that in printed copies of Justin, the word not was omitted in the sentence which expressly asserts that those who are not following the pure doctrine, who are the unorthodox, reject the Kiliastic view. Popish influence, no doubt, appears in this omission. And if you follow the footnote, we find this. George Peters refers his students. He says, the student who desires to investigate the controversy respecting the suppression of the word not will find, and here are places you can look. You can pause the YouTube video and write these down if you want. You can look up these references for yourself. Peters says elsewhere in his book, so extensively, so generally was Kiliism perpetuated that Justin Martyr positively asserts that all the Orthodox adopted and upheld it. Justin's language is explicit. For after stating the Kiliastic doctrine, he asserts it to be thoroughly proved that it will come to pass. But I have also signified unto thee, on the other hand, that many even those of that race of Christians who follow not godly and pure doctrine do not acknowledge it. And the footnote for that says, this is the passage that has been tampered with in some manuscripts, the not being omitted. For the genuineness of the passage, see Brooks, and he names others. So we have a disputed text here. In Elements of Prophetical Interpretation, Brooks says the following. This is the book referenced by Peters. A specimen shall be given from, first from the works of Justin Martyr. That passage in his dialogue with Trifo, which has already been in part adduced, was originally as follows. 
I am not such a wretch, Trypho, as to say one thing and mean another. I have before confessed to thee that I and many others are of this opinion, that Jerusalem shall be rebuilt and the saints enjoy a happy life on earth with Christ, so that we hold it to be thoroughly proved that it will come to pass. But I have also signified unto thee, on the other hand, that many, even those of that race of Christians who follow not godly and pure doctrine, do not acknowledge it. For I have demonstrated to thee that these are indeed called Christians, but are atheists and impious heretics, because that in all things they teach what is blasphemous and ungodly and unsound. If therefore you fall in with certain who are called Christians, who confess not this truth, but dare to blaspheme the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, in that they say there is no resurrection of the dead, but that immediately they die, their souls are received up into heaven, avoid them and esteem them not Christians. But I and whatsoever Christians are orthodox in all things do know that there will be a resurrection of the flesh in a thousand years in the city of Jerusalem, built, adorned, and enlarged, according as Ezekiel, Isaiah, and other prophets have promised. Now the above passage, had it been left untouched, must have remained so signal and obvious a testimony to the Orthodox faith in his days that the Romish church must at once have been convicted of having departed from the primitive belief in this matter. Accordingly, the passage in italics has been altered and the first not omitted. Thus it appears in the printed copies of Justin, and thus it was in most of the manuscripts extant in the 17th century, but not in all. For Dr. Dr. N. Holmes, in his work on the resurrection, testifies to having seen some without it. Fortunately, however, the omission of the word, though in that single sentence it alters the meaning and makes some deniers of this truth followers nevertheless of godly and pure doctrine, has the effect of giving to giving to the whole passage so forced, abrupt, and obscure an aspect that none can read it with attention without perceiving how contradictory it is. For how could any be followers in the estimation of Justin of pure doctrine and persons of sound judgment who received not this which he says all who are orthodox received? And how can the next sentence, for I have before demonstrated to thee to thee, that these are indeed called Christians, but are really atheists. How can that apply, as it evidently does, if the not be omitted to followers of that which is godly and pure? There is apparently another suppression. Justin alludes twice in this passage to his having before expressed his belief on this point, and also demonstrated the ungodliness of those who denied it. But the place in his writings where such a passage occurs is not to be found. The author of Eruven supposes, and with great probability, that the deniers of the doctrine, doctrine whom he speaks of as having pointed out, are the heretics mentioned in a passage immediately previous. But there is no mention in that passage of the things concerning which Trypho puts the question, and to which Justin replies, I told you before, that I and many others, as you, as indeed you well know, believe that these things will take place, and I also stated, etc. The probability, then, is that his sentiments were so plainly expressed in that instance that they could not be made to speak a contrary opinion, merely by the eluding some convenient monosyllable, and therefore the passage has been got rid of entire. At any rate, it must be viewed as a particular providence that, owing to circumstances which we cannot now trace, the sentiments of Justin should have been preserved to such an extent as they have been, 
and an extent still sufficient clearly to demonstrate the voice of the church to have been millenarian in the earliest Christian times. And finally, anyone who's looked into this subject knows that the church historian Eusebius was not premillennial and didn't like premillennialism. He was an anti-Kilius. He attacked us whenever he found a chance that he could. However, when referring to Justin's dialogue with Trifo, he doesn't seem to mention that Justin refers to so-called orthodox amillennialists in his day. Take a look at this. This comes from the history of the Ecclesia, the church history. Justin composed also a dialogue against the Jews, which he held in the city of Ephesus with Trifo, a most distinguished man among the Hebrews of that day. In it, he shows how the divine grace urged him on to the doctrine of the faith, and with what earnestness he had formerly pursued philosophical studies, and how ardent a search he had made for the truth. And he records of the Jews in the same work that they were plotting against the teaching of Christ, asserting the same things against Trifo. Not only did you not repent of the wickedness which you had committed, but you selected at that time chosen men, and you sent them out from Jerusalem through all the land to announce that the godless heresy of the Christians had made its appearance, and to a accuse them of those things which all that are ignorant of us say against us, so that you become the causes not only of your own injustice, but also of all other men's. He writes also that even down to his time prophetic gifts shone in the church, and he mentions the apocalypse of John, saying distinctly that it was the apostles. He also refers to certain prophetic declarations and accuses Trypho on the ground that the Jews had cut them out of the scripture. A great many other works of his are still in the hands of many of the brethren. And that is Eusebius in his Church History, The History of the Ecclesia, Book 4, Chapter 18. And this, when Justin refers to John being the author of the Apocalypse, He's referring to chapter 81 of Justin's dialogue, and the premillennial statement in question is from chapter 80 in the dialogue. Of course, our chapter breaks uh, didn't exist to Eusebius, and he would have taken the two chapters right together since they're both focused on the same subject, the millennial kingdom. So Eusebius was well aware of this part of the dialogue and didn't quote it or refer to it and saying, hey, look, by the way, there were some orthodox amillennialists back in Justin's day. Nope, didn't happen. You know why? Because Justin's manuscripts didn't say that back then, when Eusebius wrote this. They hadn't been corrupted yet. So, in conclusion, the use of this statement from Justin to try to suggest there was an orthodox amillennialism back in Justin's time is really unfounded. It relies on a disputed reading, and even if we follow the reading that seems favorable to amillennialism, it's still merely a reference to Montanism, which did exist in Justin's day, unlike a orthodox amillennialism, which did not exist in Justin's day. No, you'll have to wait for origin until you see a Christian amillennialism presented as a teaching. I hope you found this video helpful and please subscribe to my channel and please share this video with friends that are interested in eschatology. I'll see you next time.